are right, next we're going to look at some more specific structures so instead of just kind of abstract uh, general functions. So we mentioned that CNS is the brain and spinal cord and basically the function is the command center, right? Uh, integrating, uh, integrating information, processing information, information and send out outgoing instructions through which division? I'll, I have two options, sensory or motor division. Right, motor division. Right. So the outgoing structures are sent uh, in the form of electrical impulses through motor nerves into the effector organ. Right. Could be a muscle, could be a gland. All right. Now the PNF, like I said, consists of nerves. Right. So you have nerves coming or extending from the brain. That's called cranial nerves. So we have a twelve pairs of cranial nerves. And most of these nerves actually innervate uh, your brain, your neck area. But there is one nerve, the vagus nerve, extends into your thoracic cavity and your abdominal cavity. Uh, so they control uh, some of the visceral organs. So, for example, uh, it innervates your heart, so it can control your heart rate. These spinal nerves carry impulses to and from the spinal cord. So you have 31 pairs of spinal nerves. And I'll show you a picture. Um, so if those nerves carry impulses to the brain, to the brain, that means if it's two, I'm just going to write here, two brain, that's, again, I'll ask you if it's sensory or motor if the information is going into the brain, right, sensory. And same thing here, if the spinal nerves carry impulses to the spinal cord, that's part of the sensory nervous system. From, from the brain, I'm going to add here, and spinal cord too. But if the impulses are carried away from the brain or spinal cord brain or spinal cord that's going to be motor right that's going to be part of the motor division all right so the nerves serve as communication lines among sensory organs and the cns and the effector organs okay so the sensory organs could be your eyes your ears your tongue Right, um, which can, which transmit chemical information uh, about your food into your brain, and this is how you can taste things. Uh, also, skin. Right, remember you have a, some sensory structures in the skin that allows you to detect temperature change, pain, or just simple touch. Okay. All right. So again, this kind of relates back to the first slide of the nervous system, right? The three components or three kind of functional areas, right? The sensory, uh, sen the, the integration, and the motor output. Right, the brain can be divided into a few regions. Now, the first region, that's the majority of the brain, called cerebrum. So this accounts for over 80% of the brain mass, so the very big structure. And it's divided into two halves, two hemispheres. So we call those hemispheres cerebral hemispheres. Now, most of the functions are achieved are done in these cerebral hemispheres. Sensations, how you can feel things, uh, communication, how you communicate with others, how you uh, rem remember things, memories, how you understand things, to, you know, cognitive functions. You have a motor neurons in the cerebral cortex that control your muscles. And, you know, there are a lot of other functions um, that are performed by the cerebral hemispheres. So it's a very important structure. All right, the second structure, so the cerebral hemisphere is in this kind of pink salmon color. The second region is called the diencephalon. Uh, so the diencephalon is over here, okay. in this area. Now, it mostly consists of the thalamus and hypothalamus. So we'll talk about the hypothalamus in more details. The thalamus is more 
like a relay center for information going into the brain. Okay? But hypothalamus performs a lot of the critical functions, uh, which is a lot more important. So we're going to have that information on the next slide. The third region is the brain stem. So the brain stem has three parts. The midbrain, which is kind of right here, the midbrain, and there is a kind of bump. That's the pons. So the pons kind of stick out a little bit. And then the last section of the brain stem is the medulla oblongata. All right, now the, the brain stem connects the spinal cord to the brain. Okay. So uh, inferior to the brain stem, that's the spinal cord. The last area region of the brain is a cerebellum. So the cerebellum is over here. It looks like a cauliflower. So the, the cerebellum is involved in motor coordination and balance. All right, so uh, you have to know that uh, when uh, the police officers test or try to decide whether a driver is a drunk driver or not under the influence. Uh, before we have the, um, uh, the the special instrument where the driver can exhale, uh, before that, we just simply ask the driver to walk, you know, along a street line, right? So if the driver is, you know, under the influence of alcohol, as alcohol can pass the, the blood-brain barrier and affect cerebellum a drunk driver will have will lose the motor coordination and balance so it's very hard for that driver to walk a street line so this is how we can um, tell you know roughly whether anybody is under the influence of alcohol our hypothalamus is a very important autonomic nervous system um, it regulates a lot of things, you know, without you consciously knowing or consciously controlling. So, for example, body temperature. So, uh, when you have infections, your body sometimes responds by having a fever, right? So, that's when the thermos of your body, which is a hypothalamus, will reset your body temperature to a higher temperature. And what happens is that you're going to experience fever. Right? The hypothalamus can also uh, regulate water balance and thirst, uh, and a, a lot of you know the metabolic processes through through hormones and some other uh, processes. So uh, we're going to talk about that um, a little bit more when we get to the endocrine system. Right. Now, the hypothalamus is also the part of the limbic center for emotions. And so uh, the limbic center initiates physical responses to emotions. Right. Uh, I don't think people get a very kind of, um, you know, a question in depth about the limbic center. So as long as you know what it means, it's about emotions, right? That's the emotion part of the brain. Um, I think that should be sufficient. Okay. Um, and then the hypothalamus, uh, if you see any questions, I think it will be mostly related to the endocrine functions of the, of the hypothalamus. All right, now brainstem attaches, the, attaches to the spinal cord. So right here in green color. Now, um, the most important brain part of the brainstem which I've seen questions, you know, related to is the medulla oblongata. So that's going to be the last part of the brainstem before you reach the spinal cord. Because the medulla oblongata contains important neurons that control your heart rate, your blood pressure, your breathing, your swelling, uh, vomiting uh, response. So basically, want, you know, besides except for the, the vomiting part, uh, these functions are related to your survival. Right? So the, the modulo apogata is very, very important because it controls all the functions that are related to your survival. 
So if the brain stem, you know, is damaged a lot of times, uh, your your life can be in danger. All right, guys, we're almost done. One last slide. So the spinal cord extends from the foramen magnum of the skull. So that's the big uh, opening at the inferior aspect of the skull. So if you look up, you know, at the bottom of the skull, you can see a very big opening. This is where the spinal cord extends from. And it's going to go to about either the first or the second lumbar vertebra. This is where the spinal cord stops. So it actually doesn't go all the way down to the end of your vertebra column. All right, the spinal cord provides a two-way conduction pathway to and from the brain. So the spinal nerves can collect a sense of information and transmit that to the spinal cord, and then it's going to go up to the brain to be processed. Okay. Or uh, once the brain makes a decision, the information can travel down the spinal cord uh, to the spinal nerves that innervate you know, skeletal muscles, and this will generate a motor output. So it's, again, a two-way conduction. Going into the brain, sensory information. Coming out of the brain, that's the motor information. All right, now the spinal cord also serves as a reflex center. So a lot of the reflexes actually don't go through your brain. It can be done at the spinal cord level. So, for example, the knee-jerk reflex, uh, you know, where you usually have a little hammer and you just tap on the knee and then your lower limb, your lower leg will kind of kick up very fast. So that's the knee-jerk response or reflex. But the response is initiated by the spinal cord, um, which is good, right? Because a lot of times you probably need a very quick response. So uh, if the brain is not involved, that will kind of save some time, right? The information doesn't have to travel all the way up to the brain and then come back down. So uh, I think it's a pretty efficient system. Uh, you have uh, 31 pairs of spinal cord or spinal nerves. Nah. So this is the spinal cord. You can see it's surrounded by vertebrae. Oops. And then there are openings in the vertebrae uh, where the nerves, so these are the spinal nerves. And you can see they come in pairs, right? One on each side. So these openings provide uh, kind of pathways for spinal nerves or blood vessels to go through. All right, now there's a, uh, a very big nerve, a spinal nerve, that we really need to mention because I've seen questions about that nerve. So it's called a sciatic nerve. You probably have heard of this before. Uh, there's a disease related to the sciatic nerve. If there's information or damage to this nerve, it's called a sciatica. All right, now let's look at where the sciatic nerve is. Um, so it's over here on this figure. And if you look more closely, Look at the, the, the diagram on the right. You can see that there is um, a plexus of uh, spinal nerves. This is kind of the sacral plexus. So over here, from L4 to about S4, sacral S4. Okay. All right, now one of the, or the biggest nerve in this kind of bunch of nerves is the sciatic nerve right here. So you can see it's really, really big. So it's going to go through your buttock, uh, posterior of your thigh, and then travel down all the way to your leg, to your lower leg. Um, so you can see it's over here. So it's a very, very big nerve. So it pretty much it controls the, the balance of your entire leg. So if this nerve is damaged, then your leg is pretty much useless. Right? So that's a sciatic nerve. Uh, now, if you have, um, let's say, a herniated disc okay, in your lower back, then it could um, kind of compress the sciatic nerve. Then you may have a pain in the lower back, which also shoots, you know, down through your entire leg. Sorry, that's my dog barking. All right, now let's uh, look at some questions. Number one. Oh, well, I guess I'm having some sound effects with the video provided by my dog. All right, 
uh, which of the brain areas is most concerned with equilibrium, body posture, and coordination of motor activity? So think of a drunk driver. Um, that person cannot, probably cannot walk a straight line, and that's because alcohol affects which region of the brain? Cerebellum. Okay. Okay. Next question. Okay, vital centers are housed in this specific structure of the brain. And we talk about this, this is going to be medulla oblongata, right? A lot of times we just call it medulla. So medulla is part of the brain stem and it regulates a lot of the critical activities related to your survival, right? Like your heart rate, your breathing, your blood pressure, your swelling. Um, so it's a very important structure. Medulla, remember that. Number three. Okay, so this is actually a question about parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous systems. Uh, I guess I didn't move the question up to the earlier section, but it will be a good review. So what is your answer? It asks you about the function of the parasympathetic nervous system. So that's uh, rest and digest, right? So you're very calm, you're very restful. So you see digestion stimulates digestion, right? Uh, you don't want, you know, increasing heart rate. Um, you don't need bronchioles to dilate to allow more oxygen, more air into your body. You don't need that because you're very relaxed. Uh, definitely not a fight or flight. Okay, question four. So this is about the sciatic nerve. All right, so myocardial infection, infarction, sorry, uh, it's basically a heart attack. Heart attack. So it has nothing to do with your spinal nerve. Bruce, uh, calf muscle. Um, well, your muscle is bruised, but this doesn't really affect your entire sciatic nerve, right? So that's not correct. Fractured coccyx. So coccyx is your tailbone. So in other mammals, it, you know, it's still in the form of a tail, but we don't have that structure anymore. But it's your tailbone. Um, there is no nerve uh, in coccyx. So if you fracture that bone, you know, it, 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 it's the, so basically the side of the nerve doesn't go through your coccyx. So you fracture that, uh, it doesn't really affect the sciatic nerve. Now, a herniated lumbar disc could very likely affect your sciatic nerve because your sciatic nerve extends from that part of the spinal cord, right? A herniated disc can compress the, uh, the nerve, which will cause pain. And because the sciatic nerve goes through your, your hip and uh, your leg, so you are going to feel that pain kind of radiating, you know, from the lower back all the way through the leg. All right, um, we already looked at this question, so I'm going to skip that. And that's the end of the nervous system. So I hope this is helpful. Uh, and the next time, we'll look at the muscular system. All right, see you next time.